I'd like to call you tonight back over to the book of Philippians, and I'm, I won't re-preach the message tonight, but there are a couple of points that I wanted to share with you, and so we'll finish up the message tonight. The right technique for life, and that's going to be found in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let's ask the Lord to bless. Let's pray. Lord, once again we come before your throne, and Lord, we ask that you would empower the service tonight with your Holy Spirit. God, that you would speak to our hearts, that we might glorify your name, and Lord, that we might be found faithful when you return. Lord, you are worthy of everything that we have and everything that we are, and Lord, everything that we have and that we are is because of your grace. Bless, Lord, and we'll thank you, for we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, that's an important thought. I think if we keep that thought in mind, we are because of God. We exist because of God. Physically, we exist because God spoke everything into being. God didn't need us, but he loves us. Isn't that amazing when you stop and ponder that thought? God wants us to understand how to enjoy the life that he created. That's not some secret that God is hiding and harboring for himself. He's saying, I want you to know how to enjoy life. But here's the thing. We must seek him by faith. In other words, God, I'm going to take you at your word that you are promising and that you're going to give me what you have promised to give me. And that is really a life that's filled with peace, one that has joy, one that has contentment and purpose in life. And one day we will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. But the wonderful thing is, and that'll be a day, well, I tell you, what can we say then? But before that time, God wants us to enjoy that relationship. And so we come to this idea of the technique, the way to do it, right? The way we carry out a particular task, especially the execution of some performance that we're going to do. And uh, my mind goes to the, the sports arena because a lot of times there's certain uh, techniques that are used in order to perform a particular task. We, we spoke a little bit about tennis this morning and different sports, and maybe that drew you back to uh, realizing something that you had learned and somebody pointed out, you know, if you do it this way, it will work better. If you turn the hammer around and use that round part, you'll be able to drive a nail better than that other part that looks like a claw, right? It'll, it'll work a lot better. And so God wants us to know the right technique. One of the things that amazed me is you watch football players and you watch them do some things that are, it's almost like ballet especially when they play it in slow motion they're so graceful and you watch them just leap for a ball maybe they stick out a hand in midair and they, they catch it with one hand or basketball I know one of the big players back uh, when I was teaching school was Michael Jordan and I didn't know who Michael Jordan was you know, who's Michael but because my uh, students were involved with basketball I wanted to find out who this Michael Jordan was and that guy looked like he just floated in the air didn't he I mean he just kind of floated would do just some amazing things. But you know, what caused them to be able to perform like that were the trials, or we would say the practices that caused them to have that result. So God is saying, if you'll, if you'll follow these techniques or these methods, the end result is going to be found in the performance or in the ability that you'll be able to do the particular task. The reason why those football players, you ever see some of the things that those football players do? They push sleds and, and then they, they have these um, ropes and they're, they're all sectioned off in blocks and, and they're about a foot and a half off the ground and they got to lift their legs up real high and step through each, each of the holes there. And then they do all kinds of crazy things. I don't know what they call them, but they have them cross their feet this way and they're running across the field sideways doing this and they're and they're moving around they're doing all different kinds of things nobody sees that happening on game day they just see the results of it listen nobody sees our trials but our trials are specific to enable us to be the kind of soldiers that fight a spiritual battle to have victory see God does not want us to be defeated he says we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We are victors. 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have to do is believe the Lord that we might experience that and follow through and say, you know what? I trust you, Lord. Somebody says, if you'll do this, it will work better. And so we have to trust and believe them that that will take place. Now, I mentioned to you this morning, I talked to you about Moses. He was one who was the first prophet of God. He wrote the first five books of the Bible and he was used to lead God's people. And he tried to do the right thing. If you read the book of Hebrews, it says that he thought that his brother would have understood that by God that he was going to be used to lead his people to freedom. But you know what he did? He killed the Egyptian and he did it the wrong way. God put him in the desert for 40 years and there was trials and experiences that he had and then the Lord appeared to him and used him. The apostle Paul, he was trained up in the truth, but he was not operating the right way. He was not using faith in Christ. And then so God took him, by the way, three years in the desert and trained him. So we look at those two extremes. I want to tell you, God puts fiery trials. God allows trials in everybody's life to build us to, and to enable us to be a vessel for his honor and glory. I think of Joseph. You know, Joseph did everything right, but he still went into Egypt. He was still betrayed by his brothers. He was still uh, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He was still cast into prison, right? All different kinds. Of, he was still forgotten in prison for another two and a half years. But the Lord used that to help him to be the man that God want him to, wanted him to be. Look at David. David, as a youth, didn't God use him in a wonderful way? He wrote Psalms and killed the lion and the bear and he slew Goliath. And then, what? wait, he had a setback, didn't he? for about a year after he had his failing with Bathsheba. And don't misunderstand this. Look at the mercy of God, even in the midst of a horrible failure. It was a... God, His mercy makes things, all, makes things all right when we repent and say, Oh God, Psalm 51, that's David's repentance. If you read that, he was crying out before God to be forgiven, that he would be restored the joy of his salvation. He realized what he had lost when he believed the lie of the devil, the lie of the flesh, to do that which God said that he should not do. But look what God did. God even allowed, of course, the, the firstborn was died, but then Solomon came from Bathsheba. So I say that because sometimes we feel like utter failures, and I want you to know that God will pick us up out of our, our failures and still use us. Isn't that encouraging? God is not done with you and I. Everything with God is yay, yay, yes, yes, I will use you. Yes, I will forgive you. Yes, you can still honor and glorify me. And yes, you can still soar with the eagles. God doesn't want us to be failures. He wants us to be success. And here's the wonderful truth. It doesn't matter where we are in life. God still wants to use us for his honor and glory. God still wants to empower our life with his grace. So I just want to look at a couple of things tonight and finish off what we're looking at here. And I want you to see again, just for a brief moment here, we find the third technique. We find in verses seven through nine, the results of a good technique. So let's just look at that again. Go back to verse seven. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, what God is saying in that, he's saying, if you're using the right technique, this is going to be the result. So it's a, it's a way to evaluate. It's a way to see if we're walking the way that God would have us to walk. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 7 again. The peace of God which passes all understanding is in, in our life, in all of our circumstances. If it's not there, then we, what we have to say is, okay, something is not right. God, I need you to help me to make it right. So for example, if you're learning how to do something and somebody, a coach or somebody, I'm just thinking of sports, but there's many different things that you could be doing. Somebody, a teacher or an instructor would come up to and correct you on that and say, no, you want to do it like this. They might move your hand and do it, move it in a different position or something like that, whatever it is they might, might be doing. And here's what you'll find. Every time a new movement, something that has changed in your life is uncomfortable. That's why they tell you, if you're learning something, be careful that you learn, don't learn bad habits that you'll have to unlearn. You can teach yourself some things, but you can teach yourself the wrong technique, and then you have to unlearn those things, and that could be hard, but it is doable. It is possible. And so God is saying, if you have the right technique, you're going to have this peace in your life. Look at verse 8 with me. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are love lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So here in verse 8, you find a third technique. He says, this is what we're to focus on. If you want to have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to focus on these things. 
we just wiped everything out, didn't we? Just about. Look, look, notice this again. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Keep your heart, keep your mind thinking about these things. Verse 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. Do you realize Paul is saying, you've seen this happening in me. You've seen me live like this. I have shown you the way. I've not just told you about it. I have shown you how to do it, how that you might have an example. Do you know, listen, I will tell you this. It is never too late to make an impact on your family, but God must have a hold of our heart. You could be here and your kids are grown and you have grandchildren. God wants you to be, have an impact still on your children's lives and on the lives of your grandchildren, but God's got to have a hold of you. God's got to have a hold of us. You might be here and you may not have grandchildren yet. You may not have children. God still wants you to have an impact on everybody around you, beginning with your family. But it has to be real between you and him. In other words, you have to be willing to do this. You know what? I realize this is not happening, so I've got to ask you to show me how to do it the right way so that I can think about these things. Or, listen, you have some people I've watched being coached or being taught something and they're just they're not willing to change now gonna keep doing it this way and you know just don't confuse me with the facts I've already made up my mind don't change my mind (laughs) I'm gonna just I'm just gonna keep doing it this way and it's not the right way I had one kid pronounce concrete soncrete I said, no, it's concrete. No, it's soncrete. Well, he was little, right? He was young. And you know what? He figured it out. It was concrete, right? It took him a while. It took him a little while, right? He grew up a little bit older, and I never had to say anything to him. But today, if you ask him, you know, do you have any concrete? He knows exactly what you're talking about. He doesn't call it soncrete anymore. Right? But what happens is we've got to be willing to allow God to move us and mold us and shape us. And we, and we have to say, God, I want to do it your way. Because that's the way that we have victory. This is going to bring some truth to mind and to understand what's happening. So again, remember, when we talk about technique and when we talk about attributes, these are gauges. The technique is how, to, is how to get the end result. So I do this in order that this might be the result. I keep my heart and mind stayed on Christ and on pure things because this is what comes out of my heart. If my, if my heart and mind is stayed on pure things, then that's what's going to come out. If I'm thinking about the kindness, the gentleness, and the the work of the Spirit of God in my life, I'm going to be able to also, God's going to produce that in my life. As we look at this, notice what God is doing here in verse 13. And again, this is the fourth technique, if you will, or how it's done. Notice what he says here. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That, that's a positive. Paul's affirming something right there. He's saying, this is how I do it. And he's saying that so that you and I realize how it's done. This is not open for debate. You cannot do anything apart from God. Jesus himself said, for without me, you can do what? He says, mark it down. It's never, it's never going to happen. And so we have to understand the trial is not an unpleasant thing, although at the moment it may seem unpleasant. I won't say this was due to me. I was privileged in the ninth grade, JB, ninth and tenth grade, to, to be on a football team. And all I did was run and run and push sleds and run some more. And I ran gassers and I ran 90-second quarter miles. And, and I was the guy that just kept running and running, running, running. And I was, I was sick. And, and here, but listen, the team went undefeated. And then, you know, a lot of times they'd have us train with the varsity team. And those guys were giants when you're in the ninth grade. But what happened was the coach did that because we were a small team. But then when we went up against the other players, we weren't afraid of them. So what happened was... Nobody saw the two or three hour training sessions that we would have after school. They didn't see all that. And they would and they would all be there. Yeah, look, go look at you guys. You know, wow, man, undefeated. What a six and oh, you know, for that year. But it wasn't because it just happened. Listen, I cannot tell you how many times people said, man, I'm quitting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's it. After I'm not coming back next week, but they'd come back. They would come back because why? They were experiencing victory. 
They were seeing what the coaches were telling us to do was bringing success. By the way, Wyman Henderson was in that group. And, and if you know him, he, he retired from the Denver Broncos. This was probably back, back in the 90s. He was in the 10th grade. I was in the 9th grade. And I didn't have anything to do with his success. I was just glad to know who he, you know, that he was, he was a really neat, neat guy, just kind of genuine guy. And he followed what the coaches were telling him to do. And so he ended up making it to the pro, which you, pros, which you don't, you, you don't often hear of. So God says here, if you understand what the purpose of the technique is, if you understand why you're going through these things, it's that God might work his will in your life, that he might empower you. Now, I want to do something here. Notice what Paul is saying here. Look at verse 14. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. In other words, you were helping me. You were engaging me me in my affliction. But wait a minute. Listen, look at verse 12. Here's what Paul's saying. I know both how to be abased, that means with nothing, and I know how to abound, to have plenty. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed. Oh, did you get that word? He was taught. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now let's keep the context. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's more than just being victorious. God says that you have peace and contentment when nothing's going your way. You ever have one of those days? Nothing's going your way. Sometimes God's just getting your attention. I am sometimes apprehensive about encountering things I don't know anything about. I love it, not really. I love it when my kids come to me Thursday night and say, Dad, the commode's running. That's what I said. <laughs> uh oh. So what do you do? You take off the lid and you look at it. Do I know what I'm looking at? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm looking at that. I was hoping that there was a screw that I could adjust. I didn't see any. It looked like some kind of a cylinder I'd never seen before. It was late Thursday night. I said, I'll get it in the morning. So I turned the water off. Turn it on. I'm thinking, man, how long is this going to take me? I get on YouTube. Just calls me the YouTube guru. And anyway, I, I look on there and they give me some ideas, but they have all different kinds of those floating devices in there. And so I punch in the name that was on that one. And man, oh man, you know what they said? They said, put your hand on that thing, turn it, and what's happening is it's overflowing because the float is too high. Push it down and turn it back and it will... Man. That was good. But here's the thing though. Thursday night also, I find out that there's wet clothes in a dryer. Why is there wet clothes Thursday night in a dryer? So I turned the dryer back on. So maybe somebody forgot to turn it on. And the buzzer goes off, and guess what? There's still wet clothes in there. So the dryer's not heating up. I have no clue what's going to happen. I get my sidekick over there. You're going to learn something today. You're going to learn your dad has no clue what he's doing. <laughs> and so we, we get online, and there's four different things on the back of that dryer. And so I don't even know what, brother, multimeter, the ohms things, checking for continuity. I've heard of it. I've watched you do some of, some of that back here and out there, but I, I've, had, I've never done that before. And so I, I go to Menards. We're going to do this, son. We're going to do this. I'm afraid of electricity. I've watched people get zapped before. I get this, and I'm touching and nothing. But they said they told me only one of those four things is going to be dead. That's all. Just maybe two at the most. It's all dead. So I find out, you know what, did you stick it in the, in the, in the, two, in the 240, is it, for the dryer? The, the electrical socket. And I'm thinking, that's the word. Who sticks metal in a plug? But that's what you're supposed to do. And that's not working. So the thing's dead. So they said, if you'll bring the stuff, we'll check it for you. So I just, Josiah, are you watching? You got to help me remember where all these wires go. Right? So we take this whole thing apart and we take it in. And there was one device that was bad. But two parts had to be replaced, because if this goes out, the other one's right behind it. So we go ahead and we take care of that. We put it all together, turn it on, and you know what happened? It worked. It worked. That's what I did. Yes. Yes. Yeah, for about three minutes. And then it just went out. It's gone. Nothing. I said, kids, I got news for you. This, this winter, we're freeze drying our clothes out on the line. <laughs> I'm not going to go run out and 
500 bucks, you know, you're going to spend on a dryer. How do we do that? So anyway, what? <laughs> I didn't lose my joy, but I was disappointed. <laughs> I thought, man, all that work, I could have just saved myself the 50 bucks for the parts and not done it at all. So all of a sudden, my son comes out and says, Dad, the dryer's working. I said, you got to be kidding me. He said, how'd you do that? He said, he said, oh, Dad, you know, I, I was watching The Longest Day, and John Wayne said his mom told him that if it's something mechanical and don't work, just kick it and hit it again. <laughs> and you know, it's still working. It's, it's still working. And that's the wonderful thing. But you know what God was doing? You know, he was saying, I'm in control. Something, it should, know, it, how, does that, how does it fix itself? You guys are laughing because you probably know. It doesn't fix itself. <laughs> yeah, God is merciful. Listen, how does somebody with a 4,000 PSA test come down to three? If it's not God. Oh, it's the chemotherapy. Can I tell you something? You know what they say? 90% of chemotherapy doesn't work. And you know what? I'm all for taking medicine. But God, you know, th this medicine is just chemicals without your blessing. You know, it's just a little bit of water, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm all for taking medicine, but God bless it. And I'm thankful for that. There are times in our life when we just feel it's not going to work. And what we have to be reminded of is God takes the impossible things and makes them possible. How do I go from this place to the next place? Now, let me just give you something tonight to finish off with. I want to just read a text to you that will, I think, put the right perspective on our trials, which is the technique, really, to get to the right outcome. We do these things, we go through these things, that we might have the faith that passes under, the peace and the joy that passes understanding in difficult times. Go over to the book of James, just for a moment, chapter 1, and we're going to finish here. Keep the thought in mind that God says, when we have these things, it's because we had the right technique. We allowed God to work in our life. We went through the trial in a way that was a benefit. We were exercised by the trial that God had allowed in our life. We allowed it to do the work that we might be the believer, that we might be the victor that God wants us to be. So here it is, James chapter 1, verse 1. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. He says, my brethren, ready? Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. We could say all different kinds of testings, all different types of difficulties, all different types of training. That's what it is. The football player, the baseball player, anybody, look, the piano player, there's practice and practice and, and things that are done and training that's taking place so that they might be able to do the things that are blessing, that are the end result. We don't see all the hard work that goes behind it. So he says, knowing this, verse 3, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That's the end result. How come you're so patient? How come you're so still in the midst of a storm? Well, listen, there were trials that I had gone through. There were hardships. See what we see? Ready? If I could play tennis like a pro, I'd probably be playing tennis. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, there was a lot of work that went into that. When we see somebody do something, it, they just don't just do it or everybody would be doing it. There was work that went involved in, in it. There was an experience that they had that other people didn't do or didn't see. And so the end result was what they were able to do. In the life of the believer, it's exactly the same way. If we will allow God to do his work in us, and although it may not be pleasant, do you know why those crazy athletes that run races, do you know why they train all, you know, for whatever season they, they train? Because they're looking to win a prize at the end of their training. They're not looking at what they're doing. They're looking at what they will be able to do. When we go through the trial, don't look at the trial. Look at the God behind the trial that's trying to do a work in us that we might experience his joy. So with that thought in mind, here it is. Ready? Verse 4 again. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. You've got all the skill that you need to glorify God. And then look at verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. He says, so now evaluate that. Here's where you to be. And if you're at the place to where you're complaining about the trials and you don't, then say, God, help me to understand. Help me to see. Help me to have the motivation to realize that you're working on me. 
that I might be found faithful when you return, that I might hear, well done. I'll tell you, listen, I'm convinced of this. The greatest reward any believer will ever have will be to hear from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That will be worth it all. And so here it is. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, verse 5, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally. Did you see that? Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Liberally. He says, I've got more than what you need. And abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Hear that truth. God says, I will give you what you need, more than what you need, to make you a successful Christian. Believer, servant, however you want to call it. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith, with confidence. You remember this morning I told you, my aunt said... She's going to teach me how to play tennis. Do you know why I got up off the couch and why I went with her? First of all, because I was 21. (laughs) I was younger. Secondly was because I knew she could do it. I was convinced. I went out there expecting to be able to play tennis. And I had a great time. I went there for two weeks the first week. And then we spent, I don't know, about three or four days in, in Salt Lake City, Utah, snow skiing. I had never skied before. She taught me how to ski. And you know what? I was expecting. She says, I'm going to teach you how to ski. You know what? You know how I went? I didn't go, oh, I wonder if I'm going to break a leg. I wonder if I'm going to have fun. I went out there, man, because I knew she could do it. You know, listen, even more worthy to be believed than my aunt is the Lord Jesus Christ. You can mark it down. You could count it. Granted that if God says it, he'll do it. He says, I want to equip you and I will equip you. Just believe me. I'm afraid here's what we do. Ready? I'm just going to tell you my experience. I can't. That's the truth. I can't. But God says, I will do it in you and through you. So believe me when I say that, then we'll get up with expectation. We'll look forward to doing it. So verse Six, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed going nowhere fast. It's like somebody saying, Hey, I can do this. And they don't even know how to do it. I can play the piano. You want to hear? (laughs) I think I can put my two fingers together and go out a little bit, right? Chopsticks. I can't play the piano because I didn't practice and I didn't have anybody to show me and I really didn't want to do it. But if we really want from the Lord, if we believe, he says, I'm going to show you and I'll give it to you. And here it is. Verse seven, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. He says, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich and that he is made low because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Did you hear that? He says, let the brother, verse nine of low degree rejoice in that he's exalted and the rich that he is made low. He says, be thankful when these things happen because God's in the middle of it. If you're an elevator and you're brought down low, Hey, you're a partaker of Christ. He's the King of kings, Lord of lords, and came and dwelt among you and I. Hey, listen, if if you've been brought up, all of us one day will stand before God. You can't get any more exalted than that. Ready? A joint heir with Christ. Fellow heirs of Christ. A child of the King. Isn't that something? Eternal life. No more sickness, no more pain. Do you believe that tonight? That's coming. That's on the horizon. You know why we can believe that? Because of who said it. You can count on it. Man will let you down more than once. God will never let you down. And if we'll just take that little bit of faith and say, God, for you, he will do the impossible in our lives. All we have to say is me, God. Do it in me. And we'll see great and mighty things for his glory and our blessing. Would you stand as we prepare for invitation tonight? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, Lord, all that you do and all that you want to do in our life. And Lord, all we have to do is just take that little bit of faith and follow after you. And you will do a work in us. And you will give us the victory that we might glorify your name and have that joy and that peace. Have our cup pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing with your life. Lord, may we truly call upon you to do a work. Help us not just to be mediocre Christians because we serve a great God, but help us, Lord, to call out to you and say, God, do that in me for your glory. Bless the invitation, Lord, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.